What difference does knowing that God is involved in your life make to you? My name is Rabbi Yitzwine of Young Israel Asia of Las Vegas, and I want to welcome you to Life is Great, where every Sunday morning we get together, we examine another universal value derived from Judaism to see how it can make your life the absolute best life possible. Welcome back to Life is Great. Okay, you know, the other day a friend of mine calls. His name is Fred, and he says, Hey, listen, you know, Rabbi, I'm just calling to thank you. I said, Thank you. You're welcome. For what? He says, You know, I have a small company. I have about five employees or so, and payroll was coming around, and I did not have a penny for payroll. Nothing was in the account. I started praying to God, you know, God help me out. I go to the mail, check out all the mail. There's nothing in the mail. Turn around, I go to another account. There's nothing happening there. Finally, I remember, you know, there's this one account and there's a government vendor that periodically places money in that account. And I never know when that's happening, when it's not happening. So I check that account and sure enough, you know what? It's the exact amount of money I need to cover payroll. That day, was, that morning was placed in the account by that government vendor. I'm so thankful. I thank the Almighty, okay? And I call up my friend. I tell my friend, you know, guess what happened? You know, it's, didn't have the money for payroll. I prayed. This guy put the, the government vendor put the money in the account, exact amount. The person said, did you call Rabbi Wine? He said, no, I didn't. I got to call him. You got to call him and thank him. You know why? Because you and I both are thinking about the Almighty throughout the day, before things happen, during things happen, and afterwards, because we've been studying Torah with Rabbi Wine. So thank you. I was so touched. Made my week. It was like, what a beautiful thing. It got me thinking. I'm saying, wait a second. The difference between a person who's living with God on a moment-to-moment -moment basis and the person who just, you know, brings God into their life when they need him or perhaps doesn't bring God into his life at all, what a difference in existence. But I want to know from you, what do you think is the difference in your life when you have the Almighty in your life and when you're thinking about God and the difference when you're not thinking about God? And what is the quality of your life when you're engaged in spiritual pursuits or when you're just kind of going along? Went out to my favorite coffee bean and asked some of you that question. Let's see what you said and then we'll come back. We'll try and discover really how we can enhance our lives in the best possible way. Stephanie, what difference does knowing God exists make in your life? Uh, it just makes me feel better that when things are not going well, that there's someone out there that's watching over you and possibly has a hand in it. It just makes me feel better. What about when things are going well? Uh, then that's all. That's all because of me. Um, <laughs> no, I just think as a te people have a tendency to look to God when things are going not well. So when they're going well, I don't think many people are thankful and grateful. And, and I know I'm not. I don't do that. When things are going well, I just think, oh, it's because of me or whatever. Wow, that is... Isn't that true? You are so beautiful. That's true. That's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And they only talk about... I know a lot of people that have just had people die recently last like, week and everyone's like, boo-hoo, you know, God, God, God. But when everything's going well, they never talk about God. Right. But right. That is great. Okay, welcome back. How about that Stephanie? Didn't she say it all? I think she laid it out. When things are difficult, go after the Almighty. When things are good, it's all me. <laughs> okay, listen, I, how, what is the impact that God consciousness has on our lives? I think it greatly depends upon how we view God. You know, great story is told about little Johnny's 10-year-old rambunctious boy. You know, he's getting kicked out of every school. You know, he goes to all the, gets kicked out of the, all the Jewish private schools, gets kicked out of public school. Fine, last resort. Father says, listen, it's either homeschool or send little Johnny to Catholic school. He doesn't want to do it, but that's what he figures he'll do. And the first day goes, and he's expecting a call from the priest saying, listen, you know, get Johnny out of here. He's too rambunctious. No call comes. Parents are thinking, no news is good news. Well, you know, a month goes by, two months go by. Finally, they get a report card. Father calls in little Johnny at the dinner table. He says, Johnny, I was looking at your report card. Very impressed. You're getting very high scores on and, and everything, especially good behavior. So what happened? What was the change at this school? He says, well, Dad, I'll tell you the truth. The first day they put me in the front row. I looked up and I saw a picture of the last guy who misbehaved. And I realized these guys mean business. 
So listen, how we view God, that's going to determine how our God consciousness affects us. You know, the, in ancient Greek mythology, you know, you look at those gods that were made up. They were ma- those gods were as immoral as the people who made them up wanted to behave. That's what it was. They would create a God who was immoral, and that allowed me to do whatever I wanted. Another person views God as a vengeful God. Well, let me tell you, if God is a vengeful God, then you're going to approach your God consciousness with a lot of, a lot of guilt and a lot of fear. Another person stops and says, you know, I'm into the fact that God loves me. God loves me so much. I can do whatever I want. He loves me. He loves. God loves me. Okay. (laughs) How you feel about God will determine about your relationship with the Almighty. So let's stop and look at the Abrahamic God. Let's look at the Jewish God. What is our view of God and how should it positively or negatively, how should it affect our lives? So as we discussed in a previous Life is Great episode, we define God. We said that God was a non-physical, non-finite creator of the universe. That God is a creator because he creates. He's a sustainer because he continuously creates and recreates. And he's a supervisor. The Almighty is keenly aware of everything we are doing and every and everything we're thinking, every word we say, every move we make, the Almighty is aware of, and he's intimately involved with all these things. That was the Abrahamic God. You know, I'll tell you something. It's not like, it's not like a Superman view of God, or, you know, or in, in Bruce Almighty, or, oh God, you know, George Burns, you know, one of those things, like God is an old man. It's not like that. You remember, like, the um, friend of mine, he explained the, the Superman concept of God, which I think is like, is like a lot of people, almost, almost with this... Lady Stephanie was, was referring to. Remember the old, old Superman comics? You know, they had this little boy, Jimmy Olsen. He had a watch. He needed God. He was in trouble. So what did he do? He, he needed Superman. So he, you know, tapped on the watch. Superman came down, took care of him, took care of the problem. And then what was the best part about the whole scene? At the very end of the story in the comic book, Superman shook hands. They shook hands. And then Superman flew off. That was the best part. It would not have been a good story if Superman would have been hanging around Jimmy Olsen saying, hey, Jimmy, what are you doing talking to that girl? Are you gossiping? Is that really the right thing for you to be doing? No one wants a God like that. Nobody wants God like that. There are some people that view God as almost, almost like the police car that's following you. You know, a police car follows you. You, you look in the rearview mirror and you see that thing and you're driving. You get a little nervous. You don't think you're speeding. You don't think you're changing lanes without signaling, but you know he's looking out to find something wrong. And because he's looking to find something wrong, you're nervous. So you kind of like move in the other lane, you slow down, you let him go ahead of you. That's what you do. Because you don't want to be around someone who's looking out to knock you down. You want to be around someone who's looking to lift you up. The Jewish God is that God who's looking to lift you up. Because a God who loves us more than we could love our own children. But as every parent knows, love does not necessarily mean agreement. And love does never mean no consequences. As a matter of fact, if you want to do something very cruel to your children, then just show them indifference. You know, it's, it's terrible to criticize your children too much. It's more terrible, so to speak. It's meaner. It's more cruel to be indifferent to your children. So the Almighty is very non-indifferent to us. God cares very deeply about everything we are doing. And that is the Jewish God. The Jewish God is someone who's not physical, not finite. He's a creator, a sustainer, a supervisor. And he loves and cares about us and therefore creates consequences for our actions. This is a God that we can actually have a relationship with. Let me go one step further. We have to talk about some implications of an infinite God. See, the first implication there is by uh, by knowing that God is infinite is it means there's nothing I can do for God. Yes, there are rules. God lays out the 613 commandments, 10 famous commandments, But at the same time, we realize that God has expectations from us. And there's nothing we can do for God. You know, 100 plus infinity 
or take infinity and add 100 to it, it's still infinity. Infinity minus 100 is still infinity. God is infinite. There's nothing I can do that can add to him, nothing I can do to subtract from him. If I go to my father and I say, hey, dad, can I have $5? And he gives me $5. My father, in a certain sense, is less $5. But God is never less $5. He prints the money, okay? He's never less anything. So that's the first thing. Now, if I can't do anything for God, then what am I doing here? Well, it must be that an infinite God created creations for the sake of the creation. In other words, that God created me, created the world for my benefit. And that is a huge point. This is something that Abraham, when he was stopping and putting everything together, you know, remember we discussed this issue in Mesopotamia, there were different gods. There was a brick god, and a wind god, and a sun god, and a moon god. And then Abraham put it all together and said, you know, I'm going to worship the God who created all of those gods. That's the God I'm going to create. I I'm going to worship. So when Abraham worships that God, he realized, listen, I it's an infinite God. There's nothing I can do for God. That means God created me for my pleasure. And then Abraham did something absolutely remarkable that separated him from all the rest of the people. Because there were people who believed in one God prior to Abraham. We know Adam was, in, was a monotheist. Noah was a monotheist. Seth, uh, I mean, there are plenty of people. And uh, these, are, these were monotheists. Not everyone was a pagan back in Abraham's day. But what Abraham did separated himself from everyone else because he made the logical conclusion of living with an infant God. He said, first of all, there's nothing I can do for God. God created me for my pleasure. And then he said, what would be the ultimate pleasure? The ultimate pleasure would be being like God. See, we know that the more similar beings are, the more they can have a relationship. So Abraham said, what I've got to do is I've got to be as much like God as I can be so that I can get close to the infinite, to the highest pleasure. There would be small pleasures, infinite pleasures. Abraham says, I want to get close to God. Be close to the infinite pleasure. I have to be like God. What does God do? God is a giver. So therefore, Abraham became the consummate giver. He's the one who the Talmud tells us that he had a tent that was open on all four sides. So he'd look out for guests. And, he'd, and then he'd go and he, wherever a guest was traveling, he'd run out to them. He'd bring them into his house. He would feed them. And then after he would feed them, he did something very interesting. He said, let's pray. And sometimes a person would say, okay, I'll pray. And he'd pull out an idol from his backpack. And he said, let me pray to this God. And Abraham would say, no, you pray to the one God, the God of most high, the God, the infinite God. If the person refused to pray, so the Talmud says that Abraham would give him a bill for dinner. Fine, that'll be a million dollars for dinner, please. Oh, maybe I will pray to your God. That's how it would work. And through that process of giving, Abraham shared a sense of godliness with everyone else, with everyone who walked in the world at that time. That was Abraham's life. He said, God created me for my pleasure. The greatest pleasure is a connection with the infinite. And therefore, what I want to do is I want to give that connection with the infinite to as many people as possible. Now, one of the interesting things about relationships that we can learn is that we understand that every relationship is based on the lesser of the two. So, for example, if you have two people who love each other, you have a love relationship. If you have one person loves someone and the other one likes the other person, you have a like relationship. If you have one person loves the other and the other person can't stand the other person's guts, you have no relationship. A mother can say, I love my son so much, even though we have not spoken for 20 years. But she may not say correctly that she has a great relationship with her son, even though she has not spoken with him for 20 years. So therefore, Abraham also understands that he trying to have this relationship with his infinite God means it's totally dependent on Abraham. He knows God is always there. He's just waiting for, do you have, are you going to have a relationship or you're not going to have a relationship? But Abraham says, I realize it is on me and the extent that I will have a relationship is totally dependent upon me. That leads him to a great sense of personal responsibility. And this is really the foundation of having a true relationship with God, saying, I will take 100% responsibility to have my relationship with God. If I want to be, have a relationship with God, I have to be like God. What is God? God is a giver. The more I give to others, the more God-like I am. And if I end up giving the gift of a relationship with God to others, then that is following in the footsteps of Abraham. And that's why Abraham could be the father of the Jewish people. 
So I think we can really understand the, the value of having a God consciousness can really change a whole orientation towards a person's life. It's not that I should feel guilty when I do the wrong thing. It's not that I should be afraid. Yes, there's a mitzvah in the Torah, a commandment in the Torah to love God. Loving God means that I'm focused that every pleasure that I experience in this world, whether it's a physical pleasure or a spiritual pleasure, doing the right thing or having a steak or being in love, every pleasure is a gift from the Almighty. That, that's part of loving God. There's a commandment in the Torah to fear God. Fearing God on a basic level means there are consequences to my actions. When I do the right thing, I get rewarded. And when I make a mistake, I, I lose out on the reward that God could have given me if I did the right thing. And if I really do a bad thing, then I somehow better fix it up before I got to pay for that. <laughs> okay? That's what fearing God is. But most of all, it's a sense that life is meaningful and purposeful. And I think that that's really the deepest point of walking with a God consciousness. To understand that nothing happens without a reason. Now, people say this. They say, oh, there's no accidents. They say, oh, you know, everything's got a reason. Everything happens for a reason. But I, my experience has been that many times when people say that, it's almost trite. It's almost shallow. They're not really connecting with that idea that, you know what? No, if everything has a reason, then that means that God is always speaking to me in a certain sense. Now, it doesn't mean that I got voices in my head. <laughs> That's not what it is. It means that the Almighty sending me messages. When things happen, it's a purpose. It's a reason. I should listen to the messages. And I should extract whatever message is out. My rabbi, Rabbi Weinberg, of uh, blessed memory, he used to say that the Almighty is always teaching us and that God is a marvelous, articulate teacher. And we have to stop and really focus on that. So an event happens, a person's got to say, what can I learn from it? What can I learn from that message? What's God telling me? What's God teaching me? And I would say that walking with a God consciousness, thinking every single day, the Almighty is with me. He's running the world. He's involved in everything. He's always teaching me, always elevating me. So therefore, if I have a God consciousness, I'm never alone. Never alone. And I'm never, I'm never a ship without a rudder. I should always have a purpose in life. I should always have a an ideal where I can accomplish great things for myself, great things for my family and my community. Okay, so don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment with more Life is Great. We'll be talking about our rabbi's inbox. And I want to tell you, we got some great questions that will really help enlighten and expand upon why it's so beneficial for us to walk with a God consciousness at every moment. Do you know someone who needs a little more happiness in their life? Maybe it's you who needs more happiness in your life. Yes, you've seen the Life is Great TV show. You perhaps have heard the Rabbi show. But now it's time to get Life is Great, revealing the seven secrets to a more joyful you. This book was something tangible that you can give your friends and family, where they can keep by their bedside, take it on vacation, leaf through it, page at a time or chunk of pages at a time, and each time they will learn another secret, another tool that they can use in order to get the absolute most out of life. What better present can you give your friends and family than the wisdom to live a better life? Welcome back to the Rabbi's Inbox. This is your opportunity to send me any question you wish. And I promise you, I will definitely answer it. All you have to do is type your question to rabbi at the rabbishow.com. Promise I'll get back to you on it, and I might even put it on the air. Let's go straight to these, the, our questions here. The first one is, Rabbi, what evidence in the Torah is there that God controls nature? I often hear you talk about how there are no accidents in life. However, is there a good example or a proof in the Torah to illustrate this point. Well, I'll tell you, I'm gonna share with you an interesting one. And I believe that this particular example is a piece of evidence, it's proof that God actually controls history and nature. And I think it also is a piece of evidence that God wrote the Bible, that the author of the Bible is the one who controls history and nature. So when you go over to Leviticus chapter 11, where it says, Hashem, Hashem is the name of God, spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, 
Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the creatures that you may eat from among the animals that are upon the earth. Everything among the animals that has a split hoof, which is completely separated into double hooves, he has split hooves, and that brings up its cud, that is a process in the stomach, that one, that one you may eat. So a kosher animal is something that has split hooves and chews its cud. But this is what you shall not eat from amongst those that bring up the cud or have a split hoof. The camel, for it brings up its cud, but its hoof is not split. It is unclean to you, not kosher. And the hyrax, for it brings up its cud, but its hooves is not split. It is unclean to you. It's not kosher. And the hare, the rabbit, for it brings up its cud, but its hoof is not split. It is unclean to you. So therefore you have three animals that have, that chew their cud, but do not have a cloven hoof. And the pig, for its hoof is split, and its hoof is completely separated, but it does not chew its cud. It is unclean to you. And that's why we Jews do not eat pig, because even though it has a, sp a split hoof, it does not chew its cud. Question is, either man or a group of men wrote the Torah, or God wrote the Torah. And in other words, the author of the Torah is someone who has control over history and nature. If you were writing the Torah, would you write the Torah in the way that it is written? Now, remember one point over here. And you will notice in the Hebrew, you have the word ach. Ach is a limitation word, which means these are the only four animals that have one kosher sign and not the other. In other words, if you were writing the Torah, would you say, and you just decided a kosher animal means it has split hooves and chews its cud, would you say, you want to eat an animal? It has to have split hooves and chews its cud, and then leave it at that. Or would you go on, as the Torah does, and say, oh, and by the way, there's only three species of animals that, have, that chew their cud and don't have split hooves, and there's only one species in the entire world in the entire world that has split hooves and does not chew its cud. Would you go on a limb? Did Moses know every single animal that was in the entire world? Now, you know how many species of animals there are? Thousands. There's, th there's a lot. That's, that's the technical term. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of species. Do you know how many of them have one kosher sign and not the other? Four. Now, the fact that it's true is a different point. That's not even the point. Okay, it is true. So you can say, well, that's evidence to this person's question that this is evidence telling us how you can be confident that God controls history and nature and is actually involved in everything. But even more to the point, it's a piece of evidence in terms of how you know that the author of the Torah is in control of history and nature because none of us would have taken such a risk to write the Torah in such a way. Now, it's not only that example. There's another example in the oral Torah. We have something called the Talmud. The Talmud is, again, when, when God dictated to Moses, letter for letter for letter, the five books of Moses, through, in the 40 years that the Jewish people traveled, traveled in the desert from the time they left Egypt to the time they went in the land of Canaan. So there was also this issue where God explained to Moses all the information they would need in order to fulfill the commandments. So just as there are kosher animals, there are kosher sea creatures. And we find in the Torah over here, in the same, around the same place in Leviticus, we find that for a sea creature, for a fish to be kosher, it has to have fins and scales. So therefore, a salmon is kosher because it has fins and scales. A shark is not kosher because even though it has fins, it does not have scales. And lobster is not kosher because it has neither fins nor scales. Okay, so... The interesting thing about the Talmud, we have a tradition that says any animal, any fish that you see has scales will definitely have fins. If it has fins, it might or might not have scales. But if you see, if you're walking on the beach and you see part of a fish, just the midsection of fish, okay, and all you see is a piece of fish meat with scales on it, that's a kosher fish. You could eat it if you wanted. I don't know how healthy it's going to be. But you could eat it, but vis-a-vis -vis kosher, it's kosher. Because you know if it has scales, you know it has fins. Why? Because 
It was written in the Talmud that way. Now I ask you this question. Who was Moses' great-great-grandfather? Was it Jacques Cousteau? Right, Moses was, was Jacques Cousteau's great-great-great-grandfather. How many species of fish are there in the world? A lot, and more being found all the time. Now the fact that it's true, that you're never going to find a fish with scale with scales and no fins. You're never gonna find that. Every fish with scales has fins. The fact that it's true, that's a separate point. That's a separate point. This is just a psychological point that none of us would bother writing that. If you were writing the Torah, you would write in the Torah and the, and the Talmud, you would say, well, you know what? You want a kosher fish? It has to have fins and scales. And you'd call it a day. You would not add in extra information that the only positive benefit other than being a proof that it's true and authentic, is that the only benefit, the only possibility is that someone will disprove the Torah. You would not add in additional information for that. These are some of the ways that we understand that the author of the Torah was in control of history and nature. Okay, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Life is great. And I want to remind you, please send me all of your questions to rabbi at therabbishow.com. And if you happen to be in Las Vegas, stop on by Young Israel Aish of Las Vegas. Promise to make you feel right at home. My name is Rabbi Yitzwein, and remember always, life is great. Go to therabbishow.com today. Make a donation, and Rabbi Wine will send you a free Jewish calendar for the new year, along with his personal blessings. When you step into the, the world of Young Israel Aish, and you are welcomed by the right kind of community for you, so then all of a sudden you have support. You have support in terms of your personal growth, your spiritual growth. You have people you can share the good times with in your life and people who you can share the difficult times in your life. And the result that we've seen over and over again is the people who become part of our community, they just have a much greater sense of life fulfillment. They have a sense of friendship, of, of connection with community, of connection with others. Thank you so much for joining me today in Life is Great. You know, there are so many people that are benefiting from this television program, from the Rabbi Show radio program, our YouTube broadcasts, and reading my book, Life is Great. I want to thank all of you, and I want you to know that the only way we can continue to distribute and to do these programs are through your generous contributions to therabbishow.com. So I'd like to encourage you today to go to therabbishow.com and make some kind of donation. Everything is appreciated in order to help us continue to spread these positive values and enrich and enhance other people's lives. Thank you. Want more wine? Turn your radio to AM 720 KDWN or go online to therabbishow.com to hear The Rabbi Show starting right after the news at 9 a.m.